Are we all set? There we go. I'll call to order this uh, council meeting. Thank you, Worship. Item one are minutes of the regular council meeting held Monday, February 18th. The recommendation is that council approve those minutes. Second. Moved by Councillor Reamer, seconded by Councillor Nicholson. All in favor, opposed, carried unanimously. Item two are minutes of the City School Board Liaison Committee meeting held Thursday, January 17th. The recommendation is that council receive those minutes. Proceed. Moved by Councillor Robinson, seconded by Councillor Nicholson. Councillor Reamer. Thank you. Um, I just had a quick question uh, with respect to the item dog park adjacent to Glen School and, and the fact that there is um, a, a fence. Um, it's a fabric windscreen. I'm just wondering if that information has been passed along to the uh, school administrator. I mean, he, he, he lives right there, so he ought to know, but... The school district was present at the at the meeting in this discussion. I, I am talking about the school administrator, the the administrator at Glen School. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does anyone know whether the city staff have knowledge of whether the school district talked to the principal? No, no one has any knowledge. Okay, thank you. We can report back on that. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay. And uh, I'll ask Councillor O'Neill if he has any light to shed. He knows the principal. Uh, no, I don't know the principal, um, but... Um... Oops, we'll activate your microphone. One moment, please. Sorry. There we go. Yes, thank you. Um, the, uh, I did some personal investigation of the, this issue and um, talked to staff members there um, and uh, SEA teachers during... Um, recess time observed the interaction between the off leash dog park and the recess yard, uh, the, the schoolyard. And the staff members themselves are well aware of the situation. I presume, therefore, that the principal is well aware. And, and the staff members did not have any issues at that stage. They, they, they said that there had been um, um, no incidents of any type to report that the biggest issue seemed to be that when a ball would go over from the playground into the off-leash dog park, that um, the dogs would run after it. Um, but, so they would have to, uh, no, actually the dogs wouldn't even, they, they would just for safety reasons uh, make sure that there was uh, uh, no dogs around, then they would allow the kids to go and retrieve the ball, which, which would actually um, argue against putting a higher fence there because the kids wouldn't be able to easily retrieve the balls. Of course, fewer balls would go over, but some balls still would. Um, the kids wouldn't be able to climb over those balls, uh, climb over those walls, the, the higher fence. I'm getting mixed up here. Anyway, so the, the, the staff that I talked with uh, didn't have concerns. There had been uh, uh, concerns raised that the fabric that, that was attached to the fence was coming down in places so people could poke their hands through and everything like that. The fabric was actually in perfect shape, condition, uh, no problems there whatsoever. Um, so I don't. I think this issue is essentially resolved uh, from my point of view, and uh, thank you. Okay. So good fences make good neighbors, but not necessarily tall fences. That's right. Okay. Anybody else on this? It's the minutes. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. <laughs> Item three are minutes of the Universal Accessibility Advisory Committee meeting held Tuesday, February fifth. The recommendation is that council receive those minutes. Moved by Councillor O'Neill, second by Councillor Robinson. Councillor Asmundson. Well, th thank you, Mayor Stewart. I have talked with the Vice Chair of the Committee and it came out from today's committee meeting about the GSI mapping and accessibility. And what I'd like to do is add that to the work plan for the Universal Accessibility Committee to have a presentation about GSI mapping and adding in the areas that are accessible as, your, as suggestions that were made during committee today. So you're proposing GIS mapping be included in their work plan? That's correct. Okay. Uh, staff comfortable with that or do we want to need a motion? Mr. Suzak. Uh, I, I think it's clear enough, Your Worship. Uh, we'll just uh, ensure that there is uh, room on the agenda for, for that discussion. Thank, Thank you. you. Make it so. Anything else? Seeing none, the motion is the minutes. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. <clears throat> Item 3.4 is the 2013 Universal Accessibility Advisory Committee Work Plan, and this is a recommendation well, of the Universal yeah, Accessibility Advisory Committee. Yeah, it should have been there. Yeah, it should have been. Yeah. That's right. 
We did it in the wrong spot. Yes, he did it in the wrong spot, but that's why we didn't accept the motion. We only accepted direction, and staff took the direction. I don't think we need to repeat that. The motion is before us, the work plan. The work plan the is not, before Not yet before us. So I'll move the work plan. All right. Councillor Robinson, Councillor O'Neill, second, um, moves the work plan as directed. As directed. Any further discussion on the work plan as directed? All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Item 3.8 is a, another recommendation from the committee regarding accessible parking and exemptions from fees in city owned parking lots. Recommendations that Council give consideration to exempting all vehicles that display a valid spark accessible parking placard from the requirement to pay parking fees in a manner similar to those currently given to veterans. Moved by Councillor Asmundson, seconded by Councillor Nicholson. Councillor Robinson. Thank you. Well, in reading this, I just have a question about the discussion uh, that happened around this committee uh, table. Um, so is the issue around poverty or is it about machine access in terms of accessible parking? So I, I'm trying to understand uh, what, the, what the accessible issue is that this group raised. And I'll turn to either of the, I'll kind of turn to oh, Councillor Asmussen. I'll activate Councillor Asmussen's microphone. Councillor Asmussen. The, the discussion re revolved around the fact that in certain areas all handicapped parking is taken up, but you come to an area and it's a paid parking area and you have to park in a regular area that you now have to pay, but you're <coughs> handicapped. So the suggestion from the community, the talk about the community is that they, they said would the veterans get free parking anywhere within the lot and that since there's not a parking spot available, they should get a break from being paid the parking because there's no accessible spots available to them at this present time. Mm. Well, I was there, and in fact, that was the discussion. I was waiting for someone to raise the question of the accessibility of the parking meter, because it is the, occasionally the case yes. that you park, you have to go over there to get to pay for the parking, and the ramp is over here. Well, what is the point of having the parking spot next to the ramp and the parking fee uh, payable right. some distance away? Um, That's and, the other part of it. And so I was waiting for that, and I, it, it, it was raised kind of peripherally at the time. There was also a, a significant discussion about should it be only for the handicapped space, the, wheel, the wheelchair accessible spaces, uh, that if you park with a placard in, a, in a, an accessible space, you should be exempted. And the argument was made by me, actually, and others that, no, it shouldn't only, if you're doing do it, you shouldn't only limit it to those spaces, because those of us who occasionally don't, who don't need those spaces and there's another space available should be allowed to take it. I have a placard and on a bad day, I will take the closest available space, but I'll try not to take the, the wheelchair space because uh, I don't need the wheelchair space. So um, that ultimately, but the argument, so it wasn't so much accessibility, there was an argument of economics. Yeah. Oh. Or benefit. Or oh, okay. okay, so well, because the challenge becomes, I mean, paying for parking, for me in terms of an accessibility is about whether or not you can afford to <laughs> pay for parking which is different than can you use the machines? Because if, if it's hard to manipulate the machines in some ways, then that's a different issue. And so I was trying to understand why the exemption. So I'm understanding that the, the intention of exemption is that because we, we uh, um, have some ch mobility challenges, um, we ought not to have to pay for parking. That, that, that somehow that is logical, that that's the argument. I'm not sure they were advancing a logical argument. They were simply <laughs> advancing the argument. That's the argument. That's the argument. Okay. Well, um, I, I, I'm not comfortable with that actually because I, I don't I don't know that that's always connected. I know that the data would suggest that there is a correlation, but that isn't always the case, and that there are people who have very very challenged and limited incomes, and and even less so, and they have to pay for parking. So in terms of equity, I, I really struggle with that. If it's um, you know, I can't manipulate the machines because it's, there's too many buttons and they're too high and I can't see because I'm in a chair, then I want us to take a look at maybe can we do an ad by cell phone, pay by cell phone, which would make it, you know, uh, in terms of equity that everyone... Everyone with a cell phone. Everyone with a cell phone. But the idea is we need to be clear if, this, if we're going to entertain this. Which, which, what are the challenges? So at this point, I'm not comfortable um, supporting this. It just doesn't. Want to back to the committee for cl more clarification? Well, it's, you know, the committee could go back. I, 
I'm not. I'm not sure if the committee would would agree. I just don't feel comfortable with this idea of. I'm not sure what they're trying to address around accessibility. So if they could be clear, okay, I would. Okay. speaking list. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Sikora, yeah, on the that. placards. Uh, <laughs> certainly, you know, uh, the, the, this item has been back and forth here in the council chambers a few times. And my problem is very, very simple: that there's so much abuse on those plaques as far as the. Handicapped uh, parking stickers are con not sticking. Blackboards. Blackboards are concerned. There's a terrible, terrible abuse. And I, as a matter of fact, I served a notice motion here. I don't know where that's going any further, but certainly, you know, uh, you can go to any given time to a, a shopping center, Coquitlam Shopping Center, and just sit there and watch, and you'll see a parking pla uh, pocket in, in a window and there'll be four kids jumping out and running into the shopping center. Now, how good is that? You know, they, is it their father's uh, car? Is the placard used for all the families as they see fit for different cars and that type of deal? Is it, is it uh, uh, the grandmother's? Whose is it? Or is it the uh, relative one that's passed from one family to another or one kid to another to use it because uh, handicap parking can be so available when there's others that the other parking may not be available. So, you know, I, I've got some problems with this. I mean, if it was just strictly for handicapped people and legitimate handicapped people, yeah, I support it. There's no two ways about it, uh, you know. But uh, I'm afraid of uh, what is happening with the abuse of those placards. The, it's horribly, horribly abused. I go to the Coconut Grill quite often in the morning and sit there by the window and have a cup of coffee and order a toast or whatever it may be, and may have a meeting. Uh, guess what? The handicapped parking spaces, uh, when I first reported and when it was uh, televised and everything else, those spots are empty. Now you can go there, and guess what? They're full every morning. But people that are using those handicapped spaces, you sit down and you see them coming in and walking in and walking out, and they are not handicapped whatsoever. And I know that some of the handicapped, it's pretty hard to to see there may be some way of that they're handing up. But these are, you know, people that are running in and running out and, and you know, no handicap whatsoever and they're using it. So I have a problem with that one. I mean, if there's some way where we those things were enforced, strictly enforced, I could support it. Thank you. What is the exa um, What are our options at this point? Is there an annual pass that is available from the city that might work uh, for persons who have financial issues, whether they're uh, disabled or not? Um, hmm? Mr. Suzak. Uh, Your Worship, uh, my, my recollection is that we do have uh, a parking pass program, but I don't think it's tied to, um, you know, affordability issues, um, income issues. Um, uh, we, we do have, uh, similar to most other communities, I think, in the Lower Mainland, we do have um, exemptions for the, those with veterans plates, um, uh, but we don't have that exemption for the, for the Spark card, if you will, at, at this time. Okay. No, I, I just I, there is a there, there is a pass that someone can buy an annual pass. That's correct. There's a there's an annual pass that you can buy, but it's not it, you know it's not tied to. Uh, I, I you know, I'm, some not asking, I'm not asking yeah. any. How much is it? I think it's around twenty dollars, Your Worship. I'd have to check. Twenty dollars. Okay. Got one. Uh, the handy. I got to tell you, the uh, Spark placard is about twenty bucks. <laughs> um, so it might be more cost effective for them to buy the the, the parking pass. Uh, Councillor Hodge. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 when I saw this, I had much the same thoughts. And my initial thought was the same as Councillor Robinson, is what, what was the reason behind it? Was it um, the inability to access the machines, or was it a financial uh, need? And, and I think that going down the, that avenue of financial need I, I think is a, is, a, is a dangerous route to go. I think, it, I think in some cases it's even stereotypical. I don't think that because that you're disabled necessarily means that you can't afford, afford parking. And, you know, I, I, I noticed the reference to the, to the veterans. And to me, the veterans 
um, parking. And again, you have to get a plate, which is a you know very prolonged you know procedure to go through. It, it's uh, it's more cumbersome, I think, and probably uh, um, much more extensive than uh, getting a placard. But to me, that the veterans parking was an acknowledgement of a contribution that members had made to to our our country. Um, and to honor them, it's, it's a way of honoring them with a small token of giving them free parking. I suspect that it might also be extended to Freemans of the city and, and other things. But to me, that, that's done as, as an honor, uh, not as a, um, because of a disability or because of a financial uh, need. So I, I don't really see the connection to that, other than that we do make an exemption in one area. Um, to me, I, I think that it's to, yeah, I guess my first question before I go any further is that when they when somebody uses one of the registered spots and they have a placard, is that still a pay spot? The answer is, Mr. Suzak, uh, the placards uh, uh, rather pay parking included. I, I don't know for sure, Your Worship. Uh, cer certainly, if uh, you know, if 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 you've got the placard but you're not in the marked spot, uh, clearly you have to pay. Um, now, is there an exemption if you're in the? Um, the, you know the chair marks part. I'm, I'm not sure. You, I, you may know. My understanding is no. Okay. Um, I believe the because they they used to be numbered under the old system. The, the wheelchair placarded spots were also numbered uh, in the way that you would put them into the machine when you had to use the, the parking place number. So I assume that they're still paid parking. That's quite likely the case. Thank you. Because that that would be the third part of this equation. Is is it accessibility? to the machine, is it uh, income, or is it the fact that if the first two spots are gone, the third person in the lot with the placard now has to pay when the first two who got the spot didn't. But if the first two that, are, that actually have the spots are paying, then it's not a case of, I have the placard, I just couldn't have my spot, and therefore I shouldn't have to pay because I'm in a pay spot. So to me, whether or not they're all pay, or whether this is a case of you know, the last person in the lot doesn't have the benefit as the first two, then I think you have to look at this. But if it's a case of that we just want to open up parking for free, then I think we're, we're going down a road that, uh, that I don't want to go because what's going to be next? Is it seniors on fixed income? I mean, I would argue that there's probably seniors who are able that are financially less able than somebody who has a physical disability. And I, and I think that, you know, we have to sort of look at what we're trying to achieve here. And so for me, I'd like a little bit more information, maybe from staff. I'd also like to know, do other cities do this? Um, and, you know, and, and again, maybe a, a pass that they buy. Um, I, you know, I've, I've had one for years where I pay my $20, and when I'm at the, uh, I don't have to worry about it when I'm at the pool or at a soccer game. It, you know, it's a little decal that goes in my window. And if it's a convenience thing about having to make that extra trip to the other side of the parking lot to use the meter and then go into the, into the building, then maybe a, an annual pass system uh, would address the <coughs> accessibility issues and, and some of the other things. So I would really like to know from staff maybe that we have some options here uh, in terms of why we will want to do this and, and what we can do to uh, alleviate their concerns. I, Your Worship, there, there is a meeting of the advisory committee. I believe it's, um, I believe the next one is sometime next week. And uh, for that meeting, I can certainly ask attending staff to, to clarify those issues for the committee. Uh, and then uh, certainly we can seek some further clarification from the committee in terms of what were their criteria in, in this ask. Okay, Councillor Reamer. Thank you. Well, that was exactly my concern as well. Um, this motion compares um, this to giving veterans um, free parking. And, and as Councillor Hodge just pointed out, that is because um, we're honoring them uh, that they don't have to pay. This is a different situation. And I feel that I also need uh, some further information um, to make a decision on this. So. Um, do we need to move deferral of it back to the committee or? Oh, we still got a speaker, so I want to go through okay. that. Okay. Councillor Reed. Well, I totally agree with what Councillor Hodge said. I, I think we need some, some more information, but I also agree with Councillor Sikora. Um, there is so much misuse of this um, handicap parking. And I mean, it doesn't matter where you go, you see, 
you know, you say they, well, they may not be handicapped, but there's a few we definitely know aren't, except in good judgment. And um, they use the spots and um, out they hop and they're pretty happy to run in and do whatever they have to do and run out again. And, um, you know, some of them that really bother me is when you go to some of the drive throughs and you ha see a few handicapped spots and you see the construction guys driving up at noon and just parking, jumping out, getting their stuff and coming back. And, you know, where does it stop? I mean, I, I just, I, I agree that there's probably far more, not just seniors, but young mums with kids uh, trying to raise their kids and five bucks to park somewhere, that's a big bunch of money that can feed those little critters for a day. So I, 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 think it's, uh, I think it's a problem and we need to think about this very carefully before we jump into something like this. Councillor O'Neill. Thank you. <laughs> uh, one would uh, think that if there is now considerable misuse of the Spark Pass um, by people who aren't truly disabled, there would be even more misuse if somebody could say, hey, I'm going to be going down the city, can I borrow that pass and I'll throw it in my car and I can park for free. But uh, ladies and gentlemen and everybody watching at home, I want, I want to, I want to, I, I do want to alert everyone to the fact that the best bargain in town right now at City Hall is an $18 a year parking pass. You can go and buy one for $18 now Councillor Hodge has one already. I didn't know it was that inexpensive, and Councillor Robinson found it, and since I hadn't spoken yet, we agreed to have me as the mouthpiece. Um, so, so, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, come on down to City Hall and get your $18 a year parking pass, and my goodness gracious, if you can afford the insurance, if you can afford the gasoline, if you can afford the car in the first place, you should be able to afford $18 a year to park in any of the city parking lots. Thank you. You know, actually, you've just changed my mind. I now am in favor of the darn pass. <laughs> you know, it, it's one of those things, though. Um, do, I'm not sure why we opted to um, do this for the veterans. Do this for the veterans. Say veterans are now exempted from that, um, and yet, I'll, I'll tell you, there are times, for example, and I'll use one final example before we... There are times when, I, you, you, when a per, disabled person has to park in the parking lot, even though there are street parking available, for example, that isn't, a, isn't charged, but you simply you, you, you pull into the, into the hotel you're going to visit rather than park in a cheaper place across the street. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I recognize both sides of the argument here because uh, this can be, for legitimate for persons with a legitimate disability, parking can be a major challenge. Um, and this, the folks that are going to abuse the program are going to abuse the program, and I, I'm not sure we're going to be able to solve that one today. Nonetheless, the, uh, there was a hint of a motion to defer this or refer it back to somebody. We'll refer back to the Moved by Councillor Nicholson, seconded by Councillor Reamer to move it back to the committee. May I amend it? Yeah with appropriate staff information that we don't know about. Yeah, well, uh, the, 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 it's going back to the committee. We can't force the committee uh, information, but we, I'm sure staff would undoubtedly. Well, well you, your, your Worship, I'm sure this is going to be an, uh, an item that is uh, uh, discussed uh, at the next meeting, yep. and uh, we will provide uh, information pursuant uh, to that discussion, either in a memo form or an information report. I don't... I actually don't support. Okay, the motion is to refer it back. All in favor? Opposed? I'm opposed. The motion carries. <laughs> <sighs> Item four: are Minutes of the Arts and Culture Advisory Committee meeting held Tuesday, February 12th. The recommendation is that council receive those minutes. Second. Moved by Councillor Reamer, second by Councillor Nicholson. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Next item is, arises out of those minutes. It's a recommendation that Council amend the Arts and Culture Advisory Committee terms of reference to allow the committee to meet five or six times per year rather than three to four times per year. Second. Sorry, it was moved by Councillor Sikora, seconded by Councillor Nicholson. Councillor Nicholson. Thank you, Your Worship. Not on this item, <laughs> well, although I would vigorously defend the committee's wish to meet 
more frequently. They're really, really enthusiastic. But I'm, I'm a little bit challenged. The, the minutes reflect a discussion by the committee on its work plan for the year. And I had expected that to be an item referred to council for approval. The language of the minutes is a little bit confusing. It talks about the discussion on the work plan, lists a bunch of items, and then says to be referred back to the committee at its next meeting. What Councillor O'Neill, my vice chair, and I actually did was ask that staff provide us with their the committee clerk, provide us with her record of what the committee had concluded so that we could look it over, wordsmith it, and we did that and referred it back. So what you see is what the committee agreed it wished to have as its work plan for 2013 in the minutes. And I would appreciate it if we could, I'll, I'll ask Ms. Lohr's guidance. Once we've dealt with this item, might we then, I'll, I'll, without I'll, being I'll, on the agenda? I'm really out of order because this has nothing to do with the work plan. Uh, okay. We'll, we'll vote on the motion on five or six. And um, then you'll recognize And then we'll you. Uh, recognize the issue. <laughs> All in, Councillor Sikora. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that there's a few committees that uh, are, you know, somehow there's four meetings a year, three or four meetings a year. I think that, you know what, it should be call it the chair. If it, there's something important coming up and the chair feels that there should be another meeting within a month or within three weeks, they should be able to do so. So, you know, uh, uh, I, if, if, if this is a case of three or four meetings a year, I guess I was violating it with the Milagro Redevelopment Committee because I've been having a meeting once a month because it needed that, that and we were. We haven't had one now for two months and probably won't have one now till about March. But I uh, see nothing wrong with having uh, us having to go to council to try and get more meetings. Well, each, each committee has uh, terms of reference and the yeah. terms of reference for arts and culture say three or four, and so this motion is to amend that to say five or six. Yeah. Those terms of reference, of course, are passed by council at the beginning of the year, and we ought to perhaps weigh in next year as to whether we want to voice how often the meetings are. I think we do want to voice how often we anticipate the meetings would be, and then allow the committees to come back to us if they feel mm -hmm. that, uh, that more it's is more enough. often. That's my own personal yeah. perspective. Uh, Councillor Nicholson, did you have anything further on this I do. item? I can rule you out of order again. The <laughs> reference actually say three or four times a year and at, and at the call of the chair. However, in our discussion, we think or in call. terms of planning and in terms of the clerk's office knowing what to expect and laying out a calendar for the year, knowing that the committee wished to meet more often, having the terms of reference amend to provide for that, seemed only sensible. Absolutely. Uh, this is an entirely appropriate committee recommendation because and means it must abide by both of those. It must be three or four times and at the call of the chair, not or. If it were or, then you could have five or six meetings a year at the call of the chair. Um, the motion is, is five or six. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Councillor Nicholson, did you have anything further? Yes, I do, Your Worship. Thank you. So I would like you to look at the minutes at the work plan at the foot of page two where it says it was agreed the following items would be included on the 2013 Arts and Culture Advisory Committee work plan. I won't read them all to you. Effectively what the committee did was took a draft work plan and remembering what happened to its work plan last year <laughs> where we came back here with a list of items and Council quite rightly suggested that we should indicate what it was we wanted to do with those things, that they didn't just simply belong to us. So we tried to provide active language that said what we wanted to do. So we want to be involved in the 125th anniversary ce celebration. We want to consider and make recommendation on the spirit of Coquitlam grants process and so forth. Uh, so that is the committee's desire for its work plan. It recommends that to council and asks that you approve it. Are you and moving those move. four bullets and its sub bullets as the work plan? I am do indeed. Second. Moved by Councillor Nicholson, seconded by Councillor O'Neill. We work well together. Any, is, there any dis, is there any discussion regarding this completely inappropriate 
varying from floating council, of the rules of order. The rules of order. Yeah. We need to debate it for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. I find no foibles in it, Your Worship. <laughs> well, <laughs> please pass our best wishes on to the advisory committee. Item 5 is in relation to tonight's public hearing item, it's City of Coquitlam Zoning Amendment Bylaw Number 43. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. I'll allow Mr. Councillor Asmundson. Councillor, Nich uh, Councillor Asmundson would like to say something again. Once again, thank you very much. I will have to excuse myself for a perceived potential conflict. This is close proximity to my home. Exercise. A motion would be in order to. A motion would be in order to ask Councillor Asmundson to move to South Coquitlam. <laughs> No, no, come to think of it. <laughs> Wait, that's where I live. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Zakora moves the recommendation. Uh, Councillor Nicholson seconds. Any discussion? Question. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Thank you. You've been asked to move to the town center park area across the street, right up, kind of, kind of across from the garden. <laughs> Madam City Clerk. <laughs> Item six, citywide OCP amendment bylaw number 4295-2013, design guideline consolidation project. The recommendations that Council give first reading to City of Coquitlam Citywide Official Community Plan Amendment Bylaw Number 4395-2013 and refer the bylaw to public hearing. Moved Move by Councillor Asmundson, second by Councillor Reamer. Councillor Reed. Thank you. Um, on the um, day of the public hearing, could staff pre please give us back all of this? Like the whole, the whole plan so that we have it in front of us at the public hearing would help. Thank you very much. Well, sometimes we only get the first few pages, Your Worship. So. Or you could save yours and save. No. Okay. No. Okay. Anybody else? Just Motion is first reading in a public hearing. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Just to clarify, Councillor Rima brought to my attention it's 4295, not 4395, as, as noted in the first part of the recommendation. Okay, any objection to that? Okay. Item 7 relates to the Burquitlam Lowheed Community Amenity Contribution Program. The recommendation is that Council adopt a city policy a community and amenity contribution program to fund a future community recreational facility in the Burquitlam Lowheed neighborhood based on the approach recommended in the report. Authorize staff to proceed with immediate implementation of the CAC, including development of an amenity agreement for collection of the CAC and preparation of a brochure to notify property owners of the CAC and direct staff to report out to Council on an annual basis on funds collected under the Burquitlam Lowheed CAC program. Moved by Councillor Reamer, seconded by Councillor Asmundson. Councillor Sikora. Yeah, thank you very much. I have some questions on this one, and I got some problems with it. The, uh, number number one, I I'm not against building facilities in a city for for neighborhoods and people that require community centers and many other things. I'm all for it, but we used to build them before without having to sell our parking lots. You know, you know what we're doing is collecting money in lieu of parking. Well, that's what it's saying in here, you know, I mean, it, it says uh, bonus density development cost charges and DCCs and payment in lieu of parking. What does that mean, in lieu of parking? Yeah. Uh, Your Worship. Um, it's only on the yes, reporting uh, annually, but go, uh, Mr. Alvaro. Yes, uh, Your Worship, um, that section of the report simply refers to our commitment to report out annually to UDI and other developers and the public in general on all our, our funds that come into the city, including other funds. This particular one is separate. This is a community amenity contribution. It's not related to payment in lieu of parking. But, but, but 
the fact is, you, you know, you're, you're going to, you're going to be building facilities, right? And now you're saying that you're going to have an extra, and also there's an extra charge of $3 per square foot or something per, for each building, in each building, for facilities. You know, I'm beginning to wonder, why are we even asking, you know, or even allowing any high-density buildings to come up or many other things when we're going to start doing all these things as far as selling hay? Uh, you can build a building, but it's going to cost you $3 per square foot. What does it do to affordable housing? you got to think about that first. Can you imagine somebody wanted to buy a 1,000 square foot uh, dwelling unit? It is now going to cost them $300 more. Now, how smart that is that? Maybe 3000 but... You know, that, that, that you're... you're Never mind the DCCs on top of it and many, many other things. Then we'll be talking probably in a few months' time about affordable housing. <coughs> How can we build units that'll be cheaper for people that can afford it? Is this affordable housing when you're nailing the people, the developers, by $300 per unit? I'm going to use the figure of 300. Could be 200. Could be 250. Could be 500. Uh, you know. Uh, but, you know, that we're nailing the people with, with uh, this kind of money to build uh, housing. I, I think it's outrageous. Now, not only that, but you want a density? Okay, we're going to give you another 10 floors. I think a pay city so much money for extra unit, for extra floors you're going to build. Oh, yeah, by the way, you don't have to put the parking in there. But you give the city so much money, and you can get away with lost last parking. Now think about what is it that we're really trying to do here in this city. Think about it real hard. Is this a really good way <coughs> that the city should operate? You know, I, 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 there's something very radically wrong. You know, with with this type of thinking, that you know. The, the developer pay pay and the people are going to buy pay pay and then we're going to create a, a problem with parking in the area. We're going to create a problem with parking in the area that you won't be able to get the parking. Go on Cottonwood Street right now and try and get a parking spot at night. You can't because it's all taken up. Go to the side streets, parking taken up, people phoning. There's a bunch of cars parked in front of my house. What are you going to do about it? You know, that goes on and on and on. And I've got a whole bunch of lines in here to where I can go for another half an hour with this very easy. You know, so, and, and you know, believe me, the building facilities, like building a fire hall, building like a police station or the city hall, the taxpayers paid for it. You know, we didn't have to charge an extra fee so we can build a sports center in there, or that we can build a community center, or we can build a library, or we can build something else. Where do we get the money before? How do we build it before? Now it's, and I don't, really frankly, I don't know where the city's going for, but our budget is climbing and climbing and climbing to a horrendous uh, amount, and we're still short of money. We still want to build something, but we can't afford to build anything because but we're building all these high-rises. Maybe we should do away with all these things. Why are we developing the city the way we're developing and ripping, uh, ripping people off? And uh, maybe using the wrong phrase, but to me, if you're going to be charging $3 a square foot just because they're going to be building in a city, because you're going to build a facility, a baseball diamond or, or softball diamond or whatever it is, to me, I think it's it's all wrong the way we're doing it. Totally, totally. And then we can get away with a lot less parking if you pay the city some money. And then even here in the Coquitlam Center, what do you think? There's a 42-story high-rise going across the street. Where are they going to park? In our parking lot. They're selling units with stickers. They'll be using city parking taxpayers' parking lots to own a unit in that apartment, in that uh, high-rise. Now, you know, are we committed now to hold that uh, parking lot forever in a day as a parking lot that the, that the taxpayers of this city own that might be worth 8 to $10 million? <coughs> Is that what we're all about? And I can go on and on, but you know something? 
it's been since one o'clock we've been sitting at meetings and we're not through yet so it's a fairly long day but you need to rethink what is it that we're doing how much are we going to be asking from the developers how much we're going to be asking for the people to pay for their units and how much we're going to ask for the people that we're going to be selling our parking spaces for money from the developer that they don't have to provide uh, and, and it goes on and on and on. This report is just full of it. It's full of it, you know. Uh, and I, I just, I'm, I'm going to stop there because you know something? I could uh, probably talk for another 15 minutes or so, but I'm sorry, but I cannot support something like this. I cannot support anything like that. You provide the parking, you want to okay, build Councilor it? Okay, Councillor this has nothing to do with parking. This is just an amenity contribution. I this know, is, I know. Okay, amenity okay. contribution that does it with parking, of has course. No, has, has nothing oh. to do with parking. Oh, it's not. It's well, per center. It, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. You're going to be charging so much money per unit per square foot. Then you're saying here, develop a contract payment in lieu of parking. But this, that's a different issue. That's not into. It's, it's not still, in. It's still in the same report. Well, no, it's in the no. same report. I'm well, sorry. Well, no. It, it, this is, they're only saying that they're going to report out this annually, just like they report out annually <laughs> on the annual report. They report out annually on the budget. They report out annually. Those aren't all in this report. They're yeah. just things we do annually. Exactly. But that's exactly what you'll be doing, and then you'll be reporting at the end yes. of the year and all the things. Yes, you we do. will be. So, yes. You know, so to me, I think that you know what. If this is just got to be almost the end of the road where I cannot live with it. You know, what is it that we're doing in this city? We're prostituting ourselves as a city. Okay. And also on top of that, we're ripping people off to buy units. If I want to buy a unit, it costs me an extra three hundred dollars because the city's gonna charge three dollars per square foot. Now you know how real is that? So anyways I'm gonna leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Councilor Hodge. You know, I, there, there are areas right now within our city that are under pressure from development. And, and we hear on a regular basis that areas, particularly in Burquitlam, they need amenities. And we're limited to what we can do with city funds. We're limited to what we can do with DCCs. Uh, we've, we've instituted a, a program for density bonusing, but it kicks in, I think it is 3.5 or 2 point, sorry, yeah, so, but below that, we don't have a mechanism for creating a fund towards the community. And so I think that what this does is it acknowledges that we need to make a contribution at all stages of that development and that we need to be able to provide amenities to existing residents and future residents and, and they benefit from this both our existing residents benefit from it and future uh, residents benefit fr benefit from it and so do the developers because when they know that this money will be spent in their community and this is one of the advantages to this program is that the money is where the money is collected is where the money is spent so that as we see development, particularly in Burquitlam, an area that is in lacking in some of these amenities, uh, residents in that area know that by accepting new growth into their community that they will also have some of the benefits that that new growth brings and that is going to be some amenities in their own neighborhood. I think this is a good way to go. I know that in the past, in a lot of cities, it's very ad hoc, and you know, and I, I like the transparency of this. I like, you know, for developers knowing it's three dollars a square foot, and there's no other sort of hidden stuff or, or you know, contributions or deals being made. And I, I just think that doing this route eliminates the ad hoc uh, basis of asking the developer to to provide different amenities. And I think they're all valid requests, but I think here and now they know that it's a flat three dollars. That's their contribution, and if it's an amenity that's going to be shared by the residents of several complexes, that money can be pooled to use what is best needed in, in that area. And, and because it does create amenities in the area where they're collected. And, I, you know, and it's interesting reading there's a, a support from, from UDI who, who call it fair, equitable, and reasonable. And, and I think that there are some advantages certainly to the development community and, and based on that I think that's, you know, I, I, I like 
the route that we're we're going. You know, I, I wish that we could provide everything for free and that it didn't cost us anything to build these, but but somebody has to pay for the amenities that we're going to be providing, and, and I don't think it's fair to shoulder all of this on today's taxpayers, that we have to look to how do we shift it to the new people coming into the city instead of the people that have been paying taxes in the city for 20 years. This is an opportunity for new people to make that contribution by way of buying a suite or a, you know a building into a building where this amenity is being made towards the towards the city. This contribution is being made to the city, and that's one of the reasons that I I, I like the route where we're going with this. Thanks. Thank you. I, uh, I have no problem whatsoever with this. I spent um, many years as a consultant in the in the housing sector and and did a lot of work on the economics related to. Uh, community amenity charges or development cost charges and such and ultimately if it's if it's known ahead of time what ends up happening invariably is the developer pays less for the land because it's one of the inputs that they put into the pro forma if they know that they're going to pay a million dollars toward a transit levy or whatever they go out and they're going to buy five million dollars worth of land well they can't afford five million dollars worth of land anymore and no one else is bidding against them because they all know they got a million dollars worth of uh, charge against the transit so the bidding is now at $4 million. Uh, it, it Very seldom is there any residual that gets applied to the land, to the uh, finished product, because the market determines what the finished product's price is. The market is out there, and, and quite frankly, all communities that I know of are ch charging uh, community amenity charges, and almost invariably you can show that the flow is in reverse. It, the flow is back to the land value, and it's not forward to the housing cost. Um, in the end as well, though, this allows that today's residents of Coquitlam that are well served by our amenities aren't contributing as well to the amenities that are needed for the population that we're going to be accepting as a result of the Evergreen Line. The, that population needs to, that, that, assess, that development needs to fund its own services, its own um, sewer, its own water, its own road uh, infrastructure improvements because the current residents have already paid for the uh, roadways that we're driving on today. Uh, they shouldn't have to pay for the improvements that are the result of increased population, increased development. Th those uh, costs ought to be borne by the development in the same way that the community amenity that we're going to be building mostly in response to this, in this activity, this development, this residential activity, is going to have to fund the uh, the is going to have to be funded by the, the development that caused its need. Uh, economics are pretty easy to show that that's what will happen in the medium term and the long term, and it happens in the short term as long as you're upfront about it. And in this case, we're very upfront with what this is. It's been mentioned uh, by Councillor Hodge, for example. The benefit here is the transparency. It is a very transparent community amenity charge. There are some communities that charge community amenities based on almost the staff whim or the uh, uh, council whim. At some point they look at the, they use it as an income tax. It looks like you're making lots of money. We're going to take some more from you. That's not the way we ought to be doing it. We should be doing it this way. Uh, the $3 a, a square foot, I think, will be, uh, will, the, the development industry will be fine with it because they'll essentially uh, include that in the price of the land uh, in a reverse way because that's how economics works. Councillor O'Neill. Yes, thank you. Uh, good discussion. And um, we had a, a really good discussion about parking and a policy was passed dealing with that. And I'm, I'm not sure if that's fully clear to Council Sikora, but we did have that discussion. And um, so this is the mention of it in this report just deals with uh, the reporting of the results of that. So we're not passing anything new regarding parking requirements with, with this community amenity. Um, the, I, I was really pleased to see that we've engaged the, the UDI um, and uh, other interested parties so thoroughly here. Um, they have some outstanding concerns and questions, and one of them is actually you know, uh, uh, deals with the housing affordability, uh, which is touched on by, I think, all the previous speakers. And specifically, um, um, one of the developers' concert um, in this report asks if uh, new rental housing would be exempt from CACs. The UDI asks if um, the city would consider uh, 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 maybe lower CACs to um, approve, uh, to, to foster affordable housing options. Um, 
Now, it's my understanding, and I want to make sure that I'm clear on this, that uh, none of that is taking place at this stage. And on another track, we are in the process of looking at affordable house, uh, housing affordability strategy. Um, but what we have before us today has no exemptions for rental, is that correct? And no exemption for any, anybody that calls their housing af affordable. Is that correct? Uh, Your Worship, that, that is correct. Um, as Councillor Neal uh, points out, there's a parallel track we're proceeding on now looking at uh, the housing affordability, and, and that's going to be one of the topics in, in that discussion, is uh, um, how this may weigh into that. Um, in, t in terms of the, the CAC pro the proposed CAC program, the only exemptions would be uh, in much the same way with development cost charges, DCCs. If you have a building on the site, you get a credit for that floor area, so it's always the net. And um, there's also a provision, and, and Raul can speak to this at, uh, in more detail, but <clears throat> again, based on the feedback and our discussions we had with UDI and the, the home builders, um, there is uh, a request for consideration of those projects in stream, those applications in stream. So um, I think um, staff have come back with quite a reasonable balance to that, that if it's consistent with the OCP, the applications in it's going forward. Uh, again, the same way we do with uh, our development cost charges is a one-year grace period. So those would be the very limited pool of projects that would not be subject to the CAC consideration. Yeah, th thank you for that. And um, I thank you to the Mayor as well for continuing to bring forward the um, economic impact of something like this and how it's felt on the land and not necessarily on the end user because uh, end buyer. Because um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very a strong concern that I think a lot of us around this table have is about making it affordable for a young couple or young family wanting to buy a condominium or townhouse in one of these areas, uh, apartment, and, and not wanting to see all the extra expense um, on their shoulders. And, um, uh, and I think it was the UDI pointed out that uh, you know, this is, it could be unfair to the uh, young couple that says, well, we don't actually want these amenities. You know, we're willing to live without amenities as long as we get um, a cheaper price. Uh, but the mayor has pointed out, and, and I'm increasingly persuaded by the argument that the, uh, the, the, the economic impact will be felt more on the land itself. So when it, I'm not sure it was the UDI or somebody, somebody definitely said that. Uh, people are raising a quizzical look here about where that came from. I can't remember where it came from, but it was in there somewhere. One of the property people. And um, so given, given that what's going to happen in the market um, isn't going to be an onerous burden nece necessarily on that young couple or young family that wants to buy, but will be more reflected on the property owner, the, the original property owner, um, um, I think this is this meets one of my major concerns about about price and affordability. Um, also, the fact that we're not going to be asking the new buyers to essentially subsidize rental housing or subsidize affordable housing by exempting rental housing projects or exempting so-called affordable housing projects from paying the CAC. I think that's good too. I think we have to be quite fair here. Um, and um, I can't see the struggling young couple that uh, wants to buy a, a condo having to pay somehow a little extra or maybe, I'm not sure if it really does fall on them, whatever, but um, it seems unfair uh, to me to have that uh, distinction as Concert Properties was, was, was asking for the distinction for exemption for rentals. So, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with the way we're going here, and I am prepared to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Nicholson. Thank you, Your Worship. <coughs> I just wanted to get clarity on, on page 3 under point 2, length of program. There's a, there's a fairly long closing sentence that begins to address, or a couple of sentences, that begin to address my question. It's really, so what happens if an angel falls out of the sky and builds a rec center two and a half years from now when we've collected three million dollars and we're not quite ready to build because it's not big enough or, or whatever. Uh, I gather that, okay, we, we may at that point stop collecting. We might 
modify the program, staff would come to council and say, here's the situation and here's our recommendation as how, to how you proceed. So we might choose to continue the community amenity contribution and direct it differently, presumably still to the benefit of the neighborhood. Uh, or we might decide that we've done enough. It seems unlikely to me that we would decide to return any money to the developers, but there's, there's probably a whole wide range there for a decision by some future council. Uh, Your Worship, yes, correct. Um, there would be an annual reporting out of, of funds collected annually, for starters. So then there would be a sense of how much is being collected and the target. And if there's a, if the capital project comes forward through a council approval, then we would then draw in the existing funds and, and you know, uh, whatever council's discretion, build a facility as council directs that. But in the, in the interim, uh, your scenario that you've painted here is quite possible. Money is being collected, and at some point, some you know joint venture opportunity may come forward where the facility can be delivered, uh, you know, through some uh, development uh, build kind of opportunity. If that were to come to pass, and we have sufficient funds both in our fund as well as through the joint venture, staff intend at that point, based on the discussions that we've had with UDI in, in terms of transparency and fairness, to come back to council and report out and have council then look at the existing CAC and determine whether that should, ought to be modified, uh, amended, uh, stopped, but there's no intent to return any funds. It would just be a point at which, at which time we would then reconsider it as part of the, the original objective, which was to deliver a you know, a substantial community facility. If that is being delivered at this point, then we would ask uh, and recommend that council then you know, use their discretion to, to look at that at that CAC and, and determine whether it's appropriate for it to remain. But it would be council's uh, decision to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Reamer. Thank you. Well, I fully support this. Um, it's very open and transparent. And what it will give uh, the development community is, is some certainty. Um, I'll just read a paragraph out of the, the original letter we received from UDI because we have since received a subsequent email from them that says, um, when developers buy land with expectations on the fee structure, it becomes more difficult to supply an affordable product when new costs are added retroactively. So. Um, there, there is that understanding if that they know what their costs are up front ahead in time and we've been very clear about what this community amenity contribution will be and what it's going to go toward most likely, um, then um, it, uh, it creates a, a good environment um, for the UDI. I do have some concerns with the letter from the UDI. Um, I've gotten the impression that uh, there wasn't a clear understanding about the difference um, in our application of community amenity contributions and um, development cost charges. Got that impression from their letter. Um, I also had some concerns with the statement where they say this undermines the previous consultation process as it would have been more appropriate to have both policies presented at the same time. Well, um, obviously we were working on our tools in our toolbox and um, uh, so I'm just wondering after we pass, if council does pass this this evening, and I suspect we will, um, if we could write um, some sort of response to this original UDI letter just explaining uh, a few things that might provide them the information that they need um, going forward. Uh, yes, Your Worship, uh, we, we do, uh, obviously the council is aware of the follow-up letter the council that UDI has presented the city just today. Um, and that in that letter, they we have actually come to terms. And they, right, yes, UDI, absolutely. and they they do understand. We're, we're quite happy to to have that dialogue, continue that dialogue with them. I think they do now fully understand the separation between DCCs, um, bonus density, and CACs. They understand that you know these are very different funds. They're used for very different purposes and. Uh, uh, it took a while to go through that discussion with them, for sure, but we're quite happy to continue that dialogue uh, with them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Reed. Thank you. Mine's all about the program. So have we got any idea when you were going through this program, did you sort of cap off a number of units that you suppose might be built, new units in this area? Yes, Your Worship. Um, 
The original amount, the 20 to $25 million, was uh, first based on the, the size of, and type of facility that was identified in the Berquitlam plan. We then um, took that amount and distributed over the additional units expected in the Berquitlam load heat area based on the TDS. So very broadly speaking, we I don't have those numbers with me, but we, we actually took that amount and then um, based on the different land use kind of densities and land use categories expected in both shoulder and core area, then projected out the total amount of square footage um, and were able to calculate back. And, and the number that we came, that came up with was actually very, very reasonable as a flat rate. Um, we then checked with a number of developments around what that would contribute in terms of development costs, and that was quite bearable. And so that's how we came up with the number. And that does assume generally a build out over the entire uh, area, but obviously we, there's going to be a natural phasing and, and take up over a long period of time. And you look at 25 mil or somewhere thereabouts. Yes. Okay. So when within the actual program document, if there's a CAC program document, when if we acquire land, does it have to go into park or can it stay into commercial or residential? So here's what I'm asking is this. <laughs> Probably think what a weird question for her to ask. So let's say there's a, a site I like somewhere that's now zoned commercial. And I want to build on it. I may want to build more commercial space and I may want to build residential above the commercial and I want to ha may want to have a nice big rec center on the bottom. Is there anything in our CAC program that would stop me from doing that. Otherwise, does it have to be zone park? Would be the simplest way. Um, yes or no? The, the, the <clears throat> simple answer is no. Perfect. Um, the CAC, it's more a mechanism than a, okay, like a, that's like a park Okay, I dedication. wasn't sure what it was, what was in the program. So that's good. So let's talk about um, years ago when we were looking at the Berquitlam site and Morgard has a few towers they were interested in at that time on the Smith side of the Berquitlam site. And we had also talked at that time about having some kind of a community amenity there. So that wouldn't preclude them from perhaps building this community amenity, which would be right next to the SkyTrain station. It would be probably underneath the um, high rises. And would then we be able to um, upfront our share and perhaps more garden everyone else who was built would would have their share and then could we do something like a latecomer agreement where we could so my question is we would upfront and then sort of like a latecomer everyone else coming in after us up to a certain period of time would be able to pop their money in and it's just sort of like using the money before we get it right your Worship, the, the, that, that is work? exactly the, the, the real benefit of implementing yeah. a, a program like this, is that as a reliable mechanism then, we can then leverage other funding sources potentially yeah. through to upfront and then recover. That's absolutely correct. So there's, nothing, that, there's, there's nothing preventing this nothing program. Preventing it's quite flexible. That. The idea would be that if we end up taking money from another source, yeah. when we have an opportunity, then we just look back as to what, what sources have, have funded this and then continue to collect the charge until those are recovered. Okay. And then the last question I have, if there's a developer who um, has developments in other parts of our city, would they, this is only for Berquitlam, correct? But However, if there's a developer who has a development in other parts of the city, um, he, you know, it wouldn't work that way. Never mind. I rethought that one all around. I just thought when he d didn't need something, but that won't work if he's not paying any anyhow. So that doesn't matter. Okay, I think I've got what I need. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Councillor Sakura. Thank you for a second much. time. Mary, the only one thing I want to mention that uh, you mentioned, uh, Councillor Hodge mentioned, that number one, that the newcomers are going to be paying this $3 a square foot. Well, you know what? If I have a big house and I want to sell it, I've lived in Coquitlam for 40 years and paid the taxes and everything else, I want to move into one of those places. I paid the $3 a square foot, doesn't it? In fact, me too, don't it? 
It's yeah. not just the new residents are going to be coming. So we can't be using this kind of fictitious picture that somehow it's going to be new people coming to Coquitlam paying this money. It's not true. I could be paying if I want to go to move into that place. And I lived in Coquitlam for over 60 years. So, uh, you know, uh, that I, I still have to pay it, would I not? Yeah. Okay, well, there you are. So you know what? We can't use those figures fictitiously. Well, That's well, all I wanted to clear up. Okay, thank you. Well, the buyer doesn't pay it, though. Uh, the, the developer pays it, but I, I land, anyway, it's okay. Yeah, Councillor yeah. Robinson, yeah. sorry, my apologies. I, I shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> Councillor Robinson. Okay, so if I, I understand it, Councillor Sakura would prefer that we got Burquitlam um, a community center by just raising taxes. So I guess that is an option for us. We could raise taxes so that we could. We could do that, and it sounds like that's Councillor Sikora's preference, and that's what uh, what he'd prefer to do. But I prefer to not raise taxes. I think taxpayers um, have had enough of that. Um, and here's an opportunity if we're going to be be growing, because that is what we're it's expected to do. We're expected to grow uh, with that when the, typically typically that means more people coming into our community. Then we f have to figure out ways to provide them with the amenities that they that they need. Um, the other challenge, I think that we have is that because of affordability, uh, developers are building smaller units. And I think that when they do that, and, and that's what people can afford, I, I, I appreciate that. But when you do that, um, there's research that says that that means that people have to do a lot of their living outside of their living space. Um, it becomes a sleeping and eating space, but they do their living outside. And so if they're doing their li living outside in the community, then they have to have places to do that. So I think it's reasonable to uh, look at this model to make that happen, because the only other choice we have is to raise taxes. And I don't think the taxpayers of Coquitlam are really happy to do that right now. So this is, I think, a win-win. Um, I do appreciate staff working very closely with the development community um, to find the, the right balance around sort of who pays, who gets exempt, how does that play out. Um, Councillor O'Neill and I were just sort of having a little side sort of chat about, you know, where's that spot? And one of the things that I recognize is that when, you, um, when you're a developer and you take a risk and you get in early, um, you get cheaper land, but you take more risk because you don't have certainty. If what you want is certainty, then don't get in early. Wait till everything's laid out and then buy the land. So I, 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 I don't think it's fair to have it all ways, that you don't get to get in early and then get exempted. Like, that is the risk. That's why the land was so, so much cheaper. So I'm comfortable with where uh, staff have landed. I think that's, that's important consideration. Um, and I think this will be a, a great asset, uh, to, certainly to the Burke Whitlam community, so I'm fully going to support this program. Thank you. There you go. Councillor, that's it. Any further discussion? Seeing none. On the CAC, all in favor? Opposed? Councillor Sikora is opposed. The motion carries. Okay. Sorry, there was an interruption here. Uh, moved by Councillor Asmundson, seconded by Councillor Reamer to adjourn. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Uh, as is our Custom, we'll accept questions from the audience on tonight's agenda. Are there any questions on tonight's agenda? Any questions at all? Any questions on tonight's agenda? Seeing none. Thank you all for coming. For those of you who do pink shirt, Dave. Good stuff. For those of you who don't, that's.